thank you for the gift of a new day that we can gather on this Lord's Day in this way. We thank you for your presence in our midst. And as we gather now to talk about who you are in our lives and what it means to be your followers, I pray that your spirit will animate our conversation and that you will lead us into greater awareness of who it is you have called us to be in this season of our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to get us started by um, just reading a short reflection from C.S. Lewis, who is a Christian thinker, um, author. He's going to be sort of the guide for how we shape our conversation today. Um, and he writes on the idea, his reflection is entitled, Bearing Good Fruit. He says, uh, the terrible thing, the almost impossible thing, is to hand over your whole self, all your wishes and precautions to Christ. But it is far easier than what we are all trying to do instead, for what we are trying to do is to remain what we call ourselves to keep personal happiness as our great aim in life, and yet at the same time be good. We're all trying to let our mind and heart go their own way, centered on money or pleasure or ambition, and hoping in spite of this to behave honestly and chastely and humbly. And that is exactly what Christ warned us you could not do. As he said, a thistle cannot produce figs. If I am a field that contains nothing but grass seed, I cannot produce wheat. Cutting the grass may keep it short, but I shall still produce grass and no wheat. If I want to produce wheat, the change must go deeper than the surface. I must be plowed up and re-sown. So um, C.S. Lewis wrote quite a bit about what it means personally in his own life to claim Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And um, as Christians, this is sort of one of the things that we do in uh, weekly worship is um, think about and worship and discuss and learn about who Jesus is as Lord and Savior. So during the month of February, this whole month, we're just what we're calling getting back to basics of the faith. So we're combining in this class our inquirer's class, or what we call our new members class, with our adult education class. And um, for those who may want to learn more about what Potomac Presbyterian, who Potomac Presbyterian Church is and what it has to offer, we're inviting you all to be a part of this session. And then in this session, every Sunday, we gather to talk about all different topics. Today, we're going to be talking about Jesus and why he's important to Christian faith. And, and then we're using the frame for today's discussion, this book called um, C.S. Lewis's Case for Christ. we will talk more about that in a minute. Next Sunday, at same time, same place, we're going to be talking about Presbyterianism and what's unique to Presbyterianism as far as our theology and the way that we govern ourselves. On the 19th, we're going to be talking about the Bible and the way the Bible came to, about, came to be, um, what's unique about the Bible that we read and study in worship here at Potomac Presbyterian Church. And then on the 26th, the last Sunday in February, um, a professor at um, um, Virginia Theological Seminary, John, Dr. John Yeh, will teach the class on the meaning of peace and um, what, what peace means. Hi, welcome. Come on in. 
And, um, and then on the 26th, during worship, um, those who would like to do it, they do so. So um, I'm going to start, start out our time together. And this will eventually be sort of a discussion and we'll have a chance to sort of share, get to know one another a little bit. But I have been thinking about the ways that we articulate our faith. So what is it that you and I say to people when they ask why it is we are Christian? And what it is, what do we say to ourselves about why it is we're Christian? And I'm wondering who are some of the articulators of the faith today for you? Um, who, what are they saying that's compelling? How do you and I speak about our, our Christianity, our faith? What, what kind of language do we use when we talk about Jesus? What kind of language do we use when we talk about our relationship with Jesus, with the church, with faith? And then that gets at what are particularly, what are our or your core beliefs? Um, do you have a short answer for that question? <laughs> or do you have an interesting response if someone asks, um, why are you a Christian? <clears throat> I've said before in this um, setting that many of us are able to talk with ease and facility, with passion about movies that we love or about <laughs> restaurants that we love. And we recommend these strongly to friends and acquaintances and strangers um, unabashedly. But when it comes to talking about our faith, about Jesus, about our church, um, we sort of presume these are private affairs and that others will know we're Christians by our love or by our actions. Or maybe we try to hide these things because of the sort of reputation of, of Christianity that Christians have. Or maybe we try to distinguish ourselves from those Christians. Um, and I'm sure you've seen bumper stickers that say, imagine no religion. And then they have like a muted rainbow in the background. I've seen that. Just recently I saw that. And I think the point of that bumper sticker is that religion is sort of the root of our problems. And if we could just get rid of pesky religion and imagine how great life would be. So I, I think that's kind of sad. I think that's sort of a sorry state of affairs because personally, I think, I believe that it's our religion that makes us fully human. So without um, this connection to God and without this belief in a greater good, um, we are really just a, a collection of molecules um, confined to a diminished, limited view of the world, here to satisfy our carnal and earthly pleasures that we know in the material world. And if that's all there is, then we miss out on this, what C.S. Lewis calls this longing, the longing of our hearts. And as this, what some folks refer to as this materialist culture encroaches, um, I think it's helpful to have conversations about why faith, why Jesus, why Christianity. Um, C.S. Lewis has a wide, diverse and vocabulary of faith, and he um, is pretty comfortable explaining what's um, why faith is absolutely vital for a rich and wonderful life. And so we're going to use his um, sort of lens for discussing faith and Christian faith, and then we'll sort of share some ideas of why it's important for us as well. Lewis, if you're not familiar with him, his dates are 1898 to 1963. 
Um, and I picked up this book called C.S. Lewis's Case for Christ, Insights from Reason, Imagination, and Faith. Um, it's a book by Art Lindsley for my brother-in-law, who has no background in religion. He grew up never having read the Bible, never going to church, and he was sort of wanting some kind of introduction to um, what was central in his... What you do, right? Right. To both what I do and what was central in his um, wife's life. So my sister is a practicing Christian as well. Um, so um, I think this book is a takeoff on Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ. I don't know if some of you read that. I know the... Um, the women's book group in this church read it a couple of years ago. Um, and, and that book is Lee Strobel was a journalist and he was personally, um, trying to do an investigation for the evidence behind Jesus and who Jesus is. Um, so he himself was a proclaimed atheist, but his <laughs> wife, um, converted to Christianity and he started to see changes in his wife's life when she became a Christian. So he wanted to sort of disprove, he set out to disprove Christianity using the journalist's um, techniques and through his quest then became a Christian. So that's Lee Strobel's um, story. But I think um, the author of this book, Lindsley, is sort of following in that quest using Lewis um, um, drawing on his books and, and his synthesizing some of what C.S. Lewis has to, to say and making the argument for, for Christ. So he sets up this book that we're going to be, I'm going to be flipping through and, and talking about as, um, um, hoping to draw folks into a deeper relationship with Jesus by exposing them to, um, Lewis's writings. And the, it's a conversation between um, various people. There's a, a, a woman who's a literary, wants to write children's literature. So she's interested in Lewis because she's, um, uh, likes his children's literature. There's a conversation going on with an atheist. Um, he had, he knew that Lewis was an atheist. So he's interested in, in reading about Lewis's work. Then there's a conversation in here with, um, an, sort of a, a woman knows a sort of, a, SBNR spiritual but not religious person. Um, there's a person, a person, a character in this book who is a Christian who's unable to sort of articulate faith. And then there's, um, someone who's just there for the coffee clutch. And then, um, there's a searcher. So he, the way that Art Lindsley sets up this book is this conversation with all of these different people who are trying to discover and understand who Jesus is through the lens of C.S. Lewis. Um, and, and what Lindsay says is basically C.S. Lewis had these visions or experiences that he describes as bliss or um, surprise. And these experiences, he they transported him only for moments. These mo he got these momentary glimpses when he was younger to, uh, of this beautiful place. And, um, Lewis describes the quality of that was common to these three experiences that he had of bliss, um, is, it was that of unsatisfied desire. And Lewis calls these experiences joy, which he got glimpses of, and he distinguishes joy from happiness, or pleasure. And what this joy shares with happiness and pleasure is the fact that anyone who experiences it will want it again. This is sort of Lewis's way of framing this longing, this desire that he didn't quite know what it was. But later on, Lewis says these were the first glimpses that he got of, of something holy, of the divine. So C.S. Lewis was a staunch atheist, and he had this issue, um, how does one fit these romantic longings of the heart together with this robust intellectual quest that he had for reason? And his desire was to 
uncover or discover what these um, deepest longings were and have um, his explanation of them be intellectually coherent. <laughs> so he was, Lewis was strongly influenced by um, his teacher, William Kirkpatrick, who he explains as a purely logical entity. He was an atheist and a rationalist. Lewis was strongly in, influenced by an author named George MacDonald, um, and he would read his writings, which he, he said baptized his imagination. Um, it, um, there was a book called Fantasies, which Lewis read, which helped remind him of these deep longings that he had these experiences of. And then Lewis was influenced by an author named G.K. Chesterton, who was a what some call some call him a Christian apologist. He um, would sort of write um, rationally and and explain um, plausibly why the Christian faith is the way it is. And so what Lewis discovered as he was reading more and more that he was enjoying more authors who were Christians than not. Um, C.S. Lewis received degrees in classics literature and philosophy. He himself has no formal theological training. Um, he became a teacher at Magdalen College in Oxford. And he describes his journey, his spiritual journey, as moving from atheism and materialism through a period of agnosticism. Agnosticism being that humans can't know anything beyond their experience, beyond the here and now. Um, and then into uh, he was in a state of sort of idealism until he finally became what he described as a theist. Um, and he stopped at theism because he believed he could know no more. He could no more know God personally than Hamlet could know Shakespeare. Um, so nearly two years later, after he. He, he was a theist. Then he converted, C.S. Lewis converted to Christianity under the influence of Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien, um, who was a good friend and a fellow author and a fellow sort of journeyer. Um, and Lewis says Tolkien was one of the human causes of his conversion to Christianity. He um, credits Tolkien with his journey of becoming Christian. So I want to take a moment for introductions for who we have here on, on the call. Maybe say who you are, your name, um, and how you discovered PPC, Pres Potomac Presbyterian Church, and who has taught you about Christian faith, or who do you credit, as, as Lewis phrases it, who do you credit on your journey? <laughs> to become a Christian. So I'm Emily, and I discovered Potomac Presbyterian Church through the call process in the PCUSA, in the, um, oh, that's the denomination. Um, I, when the position here was open for a pastor, um, I went through the presbytery and discovered the congregation through that call process. And the person who had, I credit on my journey to become a Christian, the persons are my parents, just for the sort of grounding in the Christian faith, and also my grandparents for their example of what it looks like to live out the Christian faith. I think we'll just go around. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might go this way. <laughs> well, okay, yeah, my, my, my name is Bob Stowe. I think I know most of you here. And um, in terms of uh, Pres Presbyterian Church, we discovered it when my wife and I, we lived in New Jersey for uh, 30 years, most of our kids were born there and grew up there mostly, uh, but then in 1999-2000, uh, based upon a, a job move, a corporate move, uh, we moved down to Potomac, and this church was right there. We had belonged to Presbyterian churches up in New Jersey, so it was a straightforward match when we did church searching, 
that we wanted to become part of the church. That was very important to us wherever we were living throughout our lives. And so we discovered Potomac Church here, came to some of the services, and about a year or two after we started coming, we ended up joining because we, we felt a, a very strong match. In terms of um, folks who have most impacted me, not unlike uh, Emily, uh, my parents, and particularly my father, who was a very strong faith uh, person, a uh, very strong person in general, but watching him and the way he acted in certain situations, some of them very difficult situations, was a model for me, in addition to the fact that our family, which is maybe like most of us, uh, attended church from when I was I was baptized, and we would always go to church every Sunday, participate in Sunday school, and so on. It was a congregational church that we belonged to at that point in time, and so that was a tremendous impact on me, and um, in addition, I would say the pastor that I spent most of my teenage years growing up with in that church um, was a tremendous, uh, tremendous impact on my faith as well. So uh, those are the things that impacted me the most. I would say in thinking as Emily was talking about this question of, okay, how would you describe why you became a Christian? Is it just an intellectual thing? Is it, uh, you know, is it like all your friends are, doing it and going to church and so on so you kind of join it was none of those things for me it was it's kind of hard to explain but it's a combination a little bit what you mentioned c.s lewis about um feeling called during your life not in an official way but in subconscious ways and sometimes conscious ways as you live different experiences and i just felt a presence calling uh, that in combination with trying to wrestle from time to time with the question, you know, why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? How am I supposed to be living? Um, uh, and, and I, I, you know, you can go on and on about this, but I'm just saying those are a few things that, in fact, impacted me during this journey. I always felt from a young person that uh, there's something else other than just the physical world in me. And I've always been, even today, extremely interested in learning other people's views the theological context and life experiences and how those impact different people. Certainly I have a reflection on my own as well, but I'm interested in how those have impacted others as well. And, and so those are the things that have drawn me. Mm -hmm. My name is Robert Whittlesey. Um, we moved here about a year and a half ago to the Potomac area from Southern California. So we found Southern Christian Church through the Potomac Day Parade. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in terms of my Faith development when I was in high school, I was an atheist, and so in high school, got involved in Young Life, kind of, and read Mirror Christianity by Sid oh, Lewis. I found it to be very transformative, and then a lot of the time in college with University Christian Fellowship was very transformative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm Julie McMahon, and um, some of the people that influenced um, my faith were my parents, who make sure that I had an exposure to um, worship and Sunday school um, experiences in my young life. The way I came into, and, and I would say the other uh, people that have helped me um, grow my faith is the um, faith leaders, uh, be they formal pastors, associate <coughs> pastors, as well as people who articulate their faith well has helped me grow um, and reinforce my faith. The um, way we came to this particular church is I drove by it every day on the way to work and every day on the way home. And so when we look for a church after moving here, which took a little while to get settled, and um, then it's like, okay, it's time to find a church. And, and we went to several and uh, settled here. Thanks, Julie. Um, I'm Kate Johnson. Uh, we also moved to the area not too long ago. Um, growing up, admittedly, we were Episcopalian. We would go to services here and there. I can't say that we went every Sunday or were deeply religious. There was always some element of religion, but it wasn't like a driving force, I think, for our family. Um, what really changed for me, I, you may know Pastor Debbie Parsons um, from oh, Leesburg yeah, Presbyterian. Of course. We previously lived in Leesburg, um, and I feel like, you know, we're in a different place in our lives now. We have young kids. We felt like we wanted to, you know, 
have them grow up in a home that had you know at least some element of religion in it and going to her services really I think now as an adult and as a mother kind of really helps you be reflective on life a little bit more and put things in perspective and so I think even though it wasn't like a driving force going up um getting more involved as an adult and finding the Presbyterian church my husband Brian grew up going to Presbyterian churches um really just seemed like more of a fit and something that, you know, has an important place in my life as an adult if it maybe didn't have as much of a place when I was younger. So mm -hmm. thanks, Kate. So I'm uh, Brian, I share much of that story. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say I'll add to you in terms of um faith influences. Um I grew up, you know, in the Presbyterian Church uh native of Columbus, Ohio, and so our family would attend um you know disconnected uh through you know college um kind of early professional years and law school and then took a job back in Columbus for a period of time right after I graduated and so reconnected with our church and would attend regularly um with my parents again and um developed a you know close relationship with our pastor there at the time and um he really helped me coaching me through, um, you know, my faith development um, and getting more serious about my faith and, um, you know, led me to, you know, read C.S. Lewis and uh, mm -hmm. some other influences that have um, kind of helped sustain uh, what I call my, my personal faith development. Um, and then, you know, uh, pick up the story where, um, where Kate uh, left off. We you know, moved to Leesburg for a period of time and found a church that we liked there and a pastor we liked and have since moved and uh, had a second child and, uh, you know, feels like everybody's coming out of the COVID era. Um, and so we're, you know, actively looking for a church that we think is a, a good fit for our family and um, for our spiritual development. Thank you, Brian. Good to have you all here. Um. For me, I'd say my two influences, sorry, I'm James. <laughs> um, my two influences, uh, first would probably be my father, um, through his, um, conversion and also his stories of miracles and various things that have happened throughout his life. I'd say that really influenced me. Um, and then secondly, um, so I grew up uh, Christian, uh, baptized early, but I didn't really have a, um, it's a little bit different when you're, I guess, in a way forced to go to church versus you're, you're there for your, your own self. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I went to Nepal in 2018, I think, or 19, for my sister's wedding, when I saw what church was, in a third world country is when I realized the impact and power of it. Because um, over in the States, uh, it's, you know, churches I grew up going to and stuff, it was always like, oh, okay, you know, this is cool, this is here. But then seeing it in a third world country and the impact of social programs, the impact of um, uh, ministry from churches in America that are helping um, churches in Nepal and seeing the, the community work and the belief and how services run over there <laughs> was really impactful. I feel like from my personal faith and um, <laughs> helped um, kind of make me uh, make me feel more reinvigorated in my faith and um, want to be more active in the church. Mm. Thanks, James. My name is Ed Tennant. Um, my path here to um, Potomac Presbyterian Church starts, I guess, with um, my background. I come from a line of Presbyterian ministers um, dating back to uh, England, when, uh, or Scotland, rather. Uh, we're bid to ever be called English, but, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, came to, uh, to um, Ireland and, and, and um, pastor there and then um, migrated here to the U.S. Uh, so I've been a Presbyterian all my life and all, all my um, background. Uh, and, but the complication came when I married Linda, who uh, was a, a, a devout Baptist. 
And in fact, her father was a was a pastor of uh, the First Baptist Church in Wilmington, North Carolina. So when we got married, uh, we each brought with us our own uh, uh, faith. And, uh, and uh, so we, we um, first thing we had to do was to decide were we Presbyterians or were we Baptists. And uh, so we, we enjoyed going to different churches uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and, and, uh, and finally uh, decided that we would be uh, Presbyterians. So that's uh, how we uh, arrived at the first part of our trip. Then, uh, like Bob, uh, we moved up here uh, with with a corporate uh, transfer and uh, came here and enjoyed looking around. And there were lots of Presbyterian churches, and uh, we went to many of them. And uh, just just like the the setting here at uh, Baton Presbyterian, it was not too big, uh, it was not too small, and uh, had a you know a Goldilocks sort of effect. <laughs> So we, we we enjoyed it here, and uh, so that's uh, that's how we got here. And I've been a member of this church for forty five years. Uh, so, but uh, the influence in my life was was my mother. Uh, and she was um, she was an amazing Christian, and, uh, and and shared her faith with uh, many people in teaching. Sunday school. Uh, she even taught Sunday school in the Baptist church. Uh, we, we had a mountain house and didn't have any Presbyterian churches around. And she she was insisting that she was a Christian teacher, and so she taught Sunday school even to the Baptists. But uh, so it, she was she was my influence. Thanks, Ed. I'm Dell, and I had a totally different experience than that. A hundred percent. I grew up. Um, with my family in the Dutch Reformed Church. And the Dutch Reformed Church is easy because it's all in the Heidelberg Catechism. The questions are there and the answers are there. And, you know, we had growing up Sunday school and in Sunday school, we memorized the Heidelberg Catechism. And all of the Sunday school teachers looked exactly like Bob Stone. They were the older <laughs> men with dark suits, and by the Lord, they wanted answers. So you learn very quickly to give them answers. That all changed when I went to college. I became involved in the Presbyterian Church there through Press House, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, did their headquartered in Madison. Oh, yeah. And I was involved with the leadership there doing media programs. Mm -hmm. And then when we came out here, again, a totally different story. We went to the Episcopal Church. And we came here, and we went to the Episcopal Church, and the second time we did, they were blessing the hunt. And so all of the church, I looked like all of the church members, had their riding coats and uh, their fancy, and they had the horses outside, because they blessed the horses too. <laughs> and coming from the south side of Milwaukee, I figured, that's not me. <laughs> <laughs> And so by default, uh, we have come to the Potomac Presbyterian Church for how many years? Am I over? Do we match it or not? No, not quite. Not quite. 43. <laughs> Thanks, Del. I'm going to be so bright as in Cuba from Estratini. We just moved in America for six months. And we decided to just walk around the stage for a church where can we can worship God and find the church. And brightness, um, are you from, you're from Swaziland, is that what I heard? Yes, yeah, Swaziland. Yeah. Right. Okay. Glad you're here. You might need to check the computer so you don't log everybody oh, off. Oh. Has um, brightness, who influenced your faith? Who was formative in your life or who helped you know who Jesus is? My parents. Your parents. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, Mary Margaret Smith. And uh, it's always interesting to have a different question to look at this. And I think 
as I reflected, was not so much my parents, but my, I, I would say my childhood, I was raised Methodist on a farm in Wisconsin. And I was fortunate to have these three aunts and an uncle. And I think I questioned from the beginning, you know, what makes a good person and how uh, if you felt there's something more in life. And I felt akin on this farm more to the creation and that there is something. And then I um, always intellectually thought through high school, you know, what it is, um, I couldn't understand this from Catholics that some person could be intermediary between you and God to forgive the sins. And I just rejected that. And I was always looking for something to give a, a broader meaning to your life. So I was raised Methodist. And then when I met Dell, we we visited a lot of churches and we were involved with founding a uh, Dutch Reformed Church in Madison, Wisconsin. And then, yes, when we came here, we thought this was the best fit for our family. And I had um, a calling. I've been a Sunday school teacher off and on for all these uh, 43 years. But I think the important thing, and I recall telling a lot of the middle school kids, is whether you believe the Bible was inspired by God or written by God, but just what do these words mean, you know, and how beautiful it is and what this means uh, for you as you intellectually approach what you want in your life. And so it's given you a greater um, uh, feeling at, to, to what's important in your existence. And it gives you um, this type of joy or a calmness that you're not alone and it's, it's beyond just your normal existence. Thanks, Mary. And then, then we've been here for a long time. And, and I guess influences, I was lucky with these three aunts mm -hmm. and uncle, but then throughout these years, the various ministers, and I, we were, I was very lucky to have a, a close relationship with the older minister here who was um, very liberal when you really question, you know, and some of the questions or acceptances in the Bible, you would say, no, I don't believe that. <laughs> you know, so you were very liberal and intellectual. And so this gives you a, so then when you talk to people, you can discuss that um, you can be an intellectual and approach the substance of what this is about and have an answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm Isabel Swor. Um, I've been an active person in this church, but not a member, uh, as a youth leader for like about two years. But uh, some of my biggest influences in my Christianity and my faith are my parents and my grandparents, in particular. My uh, my mom's dad, uh, he was a deacon in the Catholic Church, and um, he himself is also a little more liberal. But uh, I always had these uh, amazing heart to heart conversations with him and like and God and what it means to be a Christian, and yeah. Thanks, so. My name is Beatrice. Uh, it's my parents who are Presbyterian, so we were born into the Presbyterian faith. But my mother's sister, who was a catechist, they were having a program, New Life for You. And in fact, my father embraced it. So every morning, five o'clock morning devotion, mm -hmm. just with the family. And then after reading, you tell what you have heard, what you have learned. Mm -hmm. So it grew the faith in me. And when I was of age, uh, we were teaching in this invalids, those who couldn't go to the big sanctuary to serve God. They gathered them in the hall of big holes, and then we go preaching to them. Mm -hmm. So this deacon enrolled me in the Bible school so that I will learn more because she saw that uh, I'm a good tool. Um, I was serving God, but God was not pleased with 
what I was doing. So it was in a dream. And I saw myself walking in darkness, jumping here and there, doing everything everybody is doing. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, somebody came and pulled me out of the darkness. Mm -hmm. And my goodness, the light was too bright for me. Immediately, I was on my knees. Mm -hmm. I was on my knees. I couldn't look at the light. I couldn't help me. I started shivering. I was trembling. Mm -hmm. oh, I've never seen that before, but I have seen the glory of God before. Mm -hmm. So when I knelt down, they lifted me up to walk in the light and never walk in the darkness again. So that is how the faith began. So I continue with the invalids, teaching them, encouraging them, supporting them, because that is a call. So I do it without hesitation. And then I had the opportunity to come to America. My mother filed for me. And when I came, I was staying with Florence and the husband. And because I was every Sunday, you go for you go preaching. It is not one particular, but it is various places. So you rotate. I said, no, I won't be in the house. We came to church service the Sunday. Then the following day, they, they left for work. And there was Sunday school, Bible study here. So I walked to this place and in fact, I was very happy I joined Potomac Presby Church. They are very loving, caring, supportive. Oh, my goodness. Even <laughs> when my sister drove me out of her place, she didn't want me to come here, to be honest and proud with you. But I don't care the distance. I said, this is my church. Therefore, wherever I am, I will come to church here. Mm -hmm. There are other Presbyterian churches around, but this is my church. Thank you. <laughs> Interesting. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris McAuliffe, uh, the associate minister here at the church. So I heard about PPC. Um, I think it was my brother, Brad, who's on the Zoom call, uh, who sent me the job application right as I finished Divinity School at Wake Forest Divinity School a year before the pandemic. And so um, we think it was December, January that the, I applied for the position here as I was finishing school and then started back in May. So I'm coming up on, is it three full years for me? Four, four full years for me here at the church. Is wow. that right? You're at five, right? So yeah, four for me uh, in this this May, which is exciting and kind of crazy. It's been four years. Um, and so my the people who influenced my faith the most were definitely my parents and family. But to give maybe a different answer, because we've heard that a lot, is I had a youth volunteer growing up, a youth group um, who was there for me really when I needed him. And so uh, it was my junior year of high school when I really questioned my faith and um, really turned my back on my faith, even though I grew up going to church and church choir and um, all that. And so, um, but there was kind of that moment of turning away. And then when I felt called to come back to the church, there was one youth leader that we met at a, um, I think it was Rubio's or something in California. And we okay. talked for like two hours straight just about faith and everything. And um, he just kind of was there exactly when I needed him. So that youth leader, Garrett, um, was a huge influence in my life and in, in my faith. Mm -hmm. Now, if those who are on the Zoom call want to jump on and um, share with us your name, and then uh, Diane, I see you've unmuted, and how you found PPC and who's influenced your journey, your faith journey. I understand. Well, I can't remember. I'm Diane Chapin. I've been a member of this church for more than 40 years. And uh, I don't remember a time when church was not part of my life. My parents met at a church, at the Swedish Lutheran Church, and that's where I was raised and was very active in the church. We went every Sunday, as most people did in those days. I went through a two-year confirmation, and like, like Dell, I had to memorize and learn and I continue with during teen years, I had Luther League, which was a social group for teens. When I went to college, I discovered I could study religion academically. I guess I was always a seeker, always trying to learn more, understand more. And I took a minor in religious studies, studying the world religion, studying the Old and the New Testament. So I continued to have church as part of my life. 
When I married and we moved to Potomac, though, with two little children, I wanted to raise them in the, the Christian faith. And my husband was uncomfortable with the Lutheran church. He felt it was just, he had been raised with almost no religious education. Uh, the legacy of having had a Puritan congregational minister grandfather who made it a little tough on his father. So the, we, I have to admit that we joined the Presbyterian church because it was more acceptable to him. And it was after joining the Presbyterian church that I really started to study reformed theology and really came to the conclusion I'd been led here because it so much suits me and my beliefs. And I've had such a wonderful experience raising my children here. As to who influenced me, so many people along the way, beginning with my mother, who was just a wonderful human being, my teachers, some of my Sunday school teachers, um, my minister, who used to answer my endless questions. And uh, I have so much enjoyed being part of this church and this kind of activity as well. Thanks, Diane. Janet, I see you've unmuted. You wanna share? Yes, hi, I'm Janet Divini. Um, I've been a PPC member since I think I joined right after COVID, I think. <laughs> right during the middle of COVID. Um, my faith journey um, really uh, started uh, when I was an adult uh, on a journey of self-discovery. Um, I was born in China and for most of my childhood um, uh, lived in China. So I was born and raised as, uh, um, as an atheist. Um, and my, my goal uh, for the first um, um, few decades is really in pursuit of earthly and material um, wealth um, as opposed to spiritual wealth. Um, I came to uh, discover Christ um, and accepted Christ uh, when I was an investment banker on a business trip in Hong Kong. Um, and I was right around that time, I was in my early 30s, um, was wondering, starting to hunger, kind of like what C.S. Lewis was saying, for something a little bit more beyond uh, the pursuit or the achievement of uh, material and earthly wealth, and started to question uh, through a self-discovery of, um, is there more to life, to my life, to, uh, more purpose to my life? Um, and I was single at the time. Um, and then so shortly after I accepted Christ, um, I was blessed uh, to meeting the love of my life, who is now my husband, Ed. Uh, and um, right um, after Ed and I got engaged, um, um, we took a marriage, pre-marriage counseling class. And then I would say that the... Um, the second uh, important milestone in my life, my journey uh, towards Christ was uh, Pastor um, Mary Thies. Uh, she was a Presbyterian pastor up in Connecticut where I, where I was living, um, where I was a hedge fund manager in Stanford, Connecticut. And uh, we, I was very overwhelmed and somewhat scared of the prospect of marrying uh, or or entering a lifelong commitment uh, with somebody. And she um, really guided me um, uh, through that fear, overcoming that fear and accepting faith and trusting uh, God. Um, and then um, I discovered reading as part of that journey and I, I discovered C.S. Lewis's book. So I actually read uh, uh, shortly after we got married um, near Christianity and thought that his perspective from an intellectual and logical perspective, which is how I was always uh, <laughs> raised, looking at risk reward and investment returns and et cetera, doing that kind of calculus. I thought he, his writing and his, his process, his thinking was um, very compelling. And, um, we have been on a journey of finding uh, the right 
a community and church ever since uh, we got married. And now we have two teenage boys and we got introduced to PPC through a fellow, um, a parishioner um, and uh, we, who invited us to come. And um, so we came and heard a couple of sermons by Pastor Emily and was, and was just mesmerized. So <laughs> uh, very inspired. And so we've been here um, ever since. Thanks, Janet. Nellie, are you there or Brad or John? Um, all right. Oh, Brad, go ahead. Yeah, my story is pretty similar to Chris. Yeah. Hi, I'm Brad McAuliffe. Um, I said my parents were the most central figures in our lives for, for religious, um, you know, kind of modeling what or Christianity could look like for our families. And C.S. Lewis actually probably was our dad's, um, the most important author for our dad's uh, uh, journey. So, um, yeah, I'd say that that he Lewis actually was one of the more central figures for us as well. We read a lot of him growing up. Uh, went through a pretty um, devout period of atheism in like college, grad school age, but in the last few years have come back to my faith and been able to explore that a bit. Joined PPC just a few weeks before uh, Chris came, right after he accepted his job or his uh, his offer to to serve there. So, a few years now for me at PPC. Um, grew up like mostly Presbyterian as well, but it's nice to be back in the, the community with this Presbyterian community here. So, thanks. Thanks, Brad and Nelly. Can um, you want to unmute? And then um, we can't quite see you. Um, all right, uh, and we can't hear you, so we're gonna just trust that you're you're there. So um, I'm gonna just move us forward a little bit. Thank you all for sort of sharing who you are and how you came here and what's been formative. Um, there are common threads, and we always learn more when we hear these things from from one another. And we certainly sort of welcome those who are new to the new to this um, community today, and are so glad that you're here. And there's Jean. Yes, I was on here. Oh, but I'm here now. Bob <laughs> and I some others, but I I was so intrigued by everybody and Bob I resonated with most but my father was an elder in the church and he was in, in it twice because he was a good friend of the minister and they had some issues in the town and he wanted him back on it was a uh, but I was renegade I mean I just went to the Episcopal church because my friend was a, an Episcopalian, and I wanted to be an angel in the in the Christmas. You can fix that. Bizarre too. Once a year, I wasn't going to church there. I went with my father, and uh, he always came and he pray first, and then he would hand me a, a lifesaver. And then <laughs> in church, and he, he was the biggest influence on my life. There's been no question about it. He raised me. I mean, he was—he's the kind of guy who was sitting at his desk one day, and he looked over at me and he said, "What would the world be like if Jesus hadn't lived?" <laughs> of course, it didn't occur to me that there'd be any question about it. Mm -hmm. But he was that kind of Christian, and he just definitely had friends, and they'd come and take his advice. And Daddy went blind at uh, 52. Mm -hmm. He had and he had two operations on one eye, didn't work. The other one he had partial vision with. So he still helped people. He did all he could do and I could go on with it. But he had he was the person they came to for advice mm -hmm. and for solicitation. He he just loved people and they loved him. And that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. So I always thought that was his gift to me. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Jean. Um, so I'm going to just, I, I realize we have just a few more minutes, but I want to say um, that Shakespeare Hamlet analogy that Lewis um, um, gave to us when he sort of remained as a deist. And then he revisited that 
Hamlet Shakespeare analogy, and he decided it was a good one, and he took it further. He said, certainly Hamlet, a character in a play, could never break out of the play and introduce himself to the author. But Shakespeare, the author, could have written himself into the play as Shakespeare, the character, and thereby made an introduction between author and character possible. And Lewis believed that something like this actually occurred in history when God, the son, became man. I thought that was sort of an interesting way yeah. of describing yeah. um, Jesus and God and that relationship. Um, one interesting fact about Lewis is that he had a photographic memory. Um, he said he was cursed with not being able to forget anything he read. <clears throat> And he said, the difficulty is I remember everything I've read and bits, bits pop up uninvited, even the most boring bits. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, I think one uh, one takeaway for today that Lewis maybe can can help us with as we go into the week is thinking about how would we um, answer that question? Um, what is it that, uh, why are we Christian? What is it that, um, if we were to answer it in maybe, you know, two sentences, what is it that speaks to our spirit about the Christian faith that help, helps us to um, claim it and name it as our own? For Lewis, um, he would say it was those those glimpses that he got of something far off, wonderful and beautiful. Maybe he would call it as joy um, that kept him yearning for something more. Um, he knew there was something more. And so he was able to sort of keep pursuing it. But as, as we go into the week, maybe um, if you're willing, next week, come back and share two sentences. This is why, this is why I'm a Christian. Um, give it some thought and, um, and then we'll share that. We're also going to talk a little bit about, um, Presbyterianism, Presbyterianism and what's unique to our, um, theology and governance. <laughs> so yeah, I, I didn't get through the book or any of what I thought, but it's really, <laughs> it's really good to just um, hear what, who has influenced you all and, and why you're here. And next week, we're going to sort of share our, I don't want to call it, I don't want to make it trite like an elevator speech, but share in two sentences, this is why I'm a Christian. You're going to give prizes. <laughs> Would that, would that be good incentive for people? <laughs> Lifesavers, yes. Top three. Top three. Top three. We could vote. Vote, vote each other. <laughs> All right. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we praise you for this community of your people and for being able to be in community with one another and with you. I pray that as we think about what it is that animates our spirits and what it is that brings us joy, that we would find ways to articulate that and live that and engage with that um, now in worship and in the week ahead, and that you would make clear for us whose we are and to whom we belong. We thank you for the gift of your son. In his name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right.